So let me go to Sarah next. Um, so Dr. Nembar had mentioned a little bit about um, she mentioned a little bit about land. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to um, some of what's what's happening around um, strategies around land trusts and pulling actually like pulling land off of the off of the market and into like collective common use. Yeah. Um, so there will be some slides, I think, but um, so. Yeah, so I'm mostly going to talk a little bit about community land trusts, which speak is... speak up a little? Sorry. Oh, Can you speak up a little? Yes. Um, um, thank you. Okay. Is this better? Yes. yes. All right. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about community land trusts, which is a key tool that can be used by communities to really take land off the speculative market um, and... Uh, create a mechanism for the community to really govern and decide what happens with the land. Um, and uh, I know this is a little speaking to the preaching to the choir, but um, one of the main problems right now with land use and management is that it really is seen as um, individual property. And so land has been commodified, and there's kind of this this predominant principle that it's kind of our God-given right to accumulate as much land as we can, to make as much money off that land as we can. Um, and there's laws, like in California, even where there's rent control, um, landowners have the right to raise the rent as, as high as the market will bear once um, people leave. And so there's this incentive to evict tenants and exploit tenants. Um, and this commodification of the land really concentrates poverty and wealth largely along racial lines. Um, so that's kind of the problem, um, but there has been other ways, other traditions of how people relate to land, even in the states. Um, so one obviously is um, the Native American tradition where land was not private property. Um, we really, uh, colonialists introduced the concept of land as private property when um, they arrived and kind of forced that onto um, onto native um, ways of thinking about land. And, but that was not, originally it was seen as something that was meant to be stewarded for the common good. Um, and then in other countries, you can go to the next slide. Um, so in India, Gandhi had advocated for land to be held in trust for the poor. And many of his followers um, kind of carried on that tradition. And there was something called the land gift movement in rural India, where some of um, Gandhi's disciples um, gather people together and they would ask people who owned land to donate um, land to the poor and there was actually an amazing response to that. Um, what they found though is when they gave, um, sometimes when they would give the poor directly or give the land directly to the poor, um, it would end up, they'd end up losing it to, to land speculators or to money lenders and so they, they changed this um, land gift movement to a village gift system called the Gromden movement where land was then donated and held by the village itself and stewarded um, for the poor and for um, agricultural enterprises rather than um, giving it directly to individuals. And so that movement actually really inspired, um, you can go to the next slide, um, inspired civil rights activists in the South in the US to create the first community land trust. Um, and it was in Georgia um, and there was this vision by civil rights activists there to um, create a net network of agricultural cooperatives for former shareholders and tenant farmers who were being kicked off their land, um, largely in retaliation for voting. Um, and they formed a nonprofit that would hold the land, um, so hold the land in perpetuity off of the market, and then um, lease the land in these long-term inheritable leases to the farmers. Um, who could then build equity in the buildings and the improvements on the land um, and just have stable land tenure there for their enterprises. Um, and in, by 1970, they were able to purchase um, 5,000 acres of land, which at the time was the largest tract of land owned by African Americans in the U.S., and they cooperatively farmed it for nearly 15 years. Um, and that um, really became kind of the model for land trusts going forward. 
Um, although now nowadays land trusts or community land trusts are largely used for affordable housing purposes and kind of a grassroots resistance to gentrification. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So this image, which may be a little difficult to see, um, kind of demonstrates what a community land trust or a CLT does. So a CLT is a nonprofit organization that holds, usually holds title. There's some variations, but the typical model is that the CLT will hold title to land and then offer long-term leases to people who will either buy or develop the buildings on the land. So they never, the individuals who own the buildings and developments on the land never own the land itself. They're also restricted in how much they can sell those improvements for um, when they go to sell um, the, the houses or buildings on the land. Um, go to the next slide. The other, another distinguishing feature about community land trusts is that they are governed by the community. So the board is represented um, typically, one third of the board represents leaseholders, so people living on the land and working on the land. One third represents residents in the surrounding community. And then one third are public representatives. They might be public officials, local funders, nonprofits. Um, so this board is really uh, accountable to the community and their voting membership, which is made up of people who live, either live on the land or near in that nearby community. Um, next slide. So these are some of just, I'll just briefly talk about the uh, legal mechanics to how this works. Um, I've talked a little bit about this already, but um, CLTs are usually tax exempt 501c3 nonprofits, and so they're eligible for grant funding. Um, and so they'll take donations of money or land, um, and they can often qualify, if, they're, if their purpose is for affordable housing, they can qualify for affordable housing subsidies. Um, and I mentioned that they are governed by um, it's a, they're membership nonprofits, and so they're governed by um, people in the community. And um, there's, they're beginning to move beyond, or I guess moving back to um, purposes uh, beyond affordable housing to things like urban agriculture or commercial uses. There's land trusts that have um, specifically um, sought to uh, foster um, cooperative businesses on their land. Um, so there's really ways that community land trusts can work with other kind of um, economic, uh, democratic uh, enterprises in the community. Um, so at the end, usually the, the lease terms are for 99 years and are renewable. So it's 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 very similar to an ownership um, interest in the in the improvements on the land, um, but there's uh, but they are not um, able to kind of make a windfall off of selling the, the buildings or the improvements on the land. There, there's a, a formula that limits how much they can resell it for. Often there's also criteria about who can actually buy the, the homes or the buildings on the land. Um, they might be, uh, you know, they have to be low income or the land trust often has a right to repurchase those improvements on the land. So the, the community land trust really is stewarding um, the land and, and the, um, the, even the buildings on the land for the community. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, so some of, these are just some examples of what community land trusts um, have achieved. So affordable housing is kind of their, the primary um, purpose that they're being used for now. Um, they, CLTs really allow residents who ordinarily wouldn't have been able to afford to buy a home to own a home and to build equity um, and avoid displacement. So they're not going to make a windfall in their investment, but they'll be able to build a significant amount um, of equity. And um, But the CLT uh, retains the land permanently, and the land itself can never be sold. Um, it can also allow communities to collectively purchase affordable housing as housing co-ops um, in partnership with a nonprofit CLT. Um, and lim limited equity cooperatives in particular can provide these asset building opportunities for low income households who normally wouldn't have been able to do that, um, particularly households who couldn't afford, who couldn't um, access mortgage financing. Um, and in those uh, housing co-ops, the households would purchase a share of the co-op, which gives them right to a unit um, and a vote in the co-op's governance, and they can, again, earn modest equity. 
um, and it protects them from the market pressures of um, displacement and evictions. So an example here is the Pigeon Palace in San Francisco, which was, um, it's a six unit, oh sorry, back one. Uh, it's a six unit building, and it was home uh, to local community activists, artists, local business owners, and they were at risk of eviction when the building was put on the market at a probate auction. But the San Francisco Community Land Trust was able to work with the tenants um, to find financing, and they were able to beat some real estate speculators that came forward trying to buy this land. Um, and they were able to purchase the building, and, and now they're converting it to a limited equity cooperative. So those original tenants actually are going to own this building together, and this nonprofit land trust now owns the land under the building, and so it can never be sold. Go to the next one. So some other achievements is, um, you know, CLTs really allow for community-driven development of land, which is not typically how it's done. So, um, you know, local government processes are, are supposedly open to public participation, but it's usually the people who have the most money and influence over policymakers that really drive how land is developed. So CLTs can be used differently in that communities can come together and plan for themselves what's going to happen on that land. Um, and let's see. so some, some more recent movements by CLTs now is to um, start incorporating urban agriculture, um, community-based and cooperative businesses and other uses um, into their land use. Um, because, you know, real estate speculation doesn't only affect uh, residential tenants, but also commercial um, tenants who actually have less protections um, than residential tenants. So you see communities where um, historic businesses are being evicted and they have really no recourse. So CLTs can um, be instrumental in protecting against that as well. Um, so the example here is uh, Dudley Neighbors, which is a community land trust in Boston. Um, and they were able to take possession of most of um, a large number of vacant lots in a blighted area of the city. They either, um, they were able to purchase them from private owners using foundation money, or actually some of them they obtained for almost nothing from the city. Um, and they, uh, they're, they've created a number of housing units, um, some that are uh, owner occupied, some are housing, um, limited equity cooperatives, some are rental units. Uh, but they've also incorporated things like urban ag, um, parks, a uh, greenhouse, an urban farm. Um, they've developed uh, a charter school, educational activities on the farms, and they're creating this whole new kind of local food economy using the land in this way. Um, so these are just some examples of kind of the exciting ways that CLTs can be part of this movement. All right. 